as we begin to pray before the service with the team, Sherry Tipton began to release just some things that she was hearing from the Lord today as she was considering the service. And as she was sharing, it was just like, for me, it was like this spirit of revelation was just coming off of her. And even more than what she was saying, which was powerful, it was just the spirit she was saying it in. And it almost like got a hold of me. And I was like, Lord, I just want that spirit to be released in the room, the spirit of revelation. And it came to me in a specific way that God wants to release upon you tonight the spirit of revelation that gives you access to your personal assignment, your personal story in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you, God has uh, so much for you. God has so much for you in Christ. You can't imagine, you can't wrap your head around it. It's just amazing. And it takes revelation to receive it because it's so much that if your natural man tried to ascertain it, it just, it wouldn't compute. And as we were praying tonight, this came out again and again. God wants to speak to us tonight as children because, and it's going to be, what well, the things he's going to say to you is going to sound maybe seem funny or silly or like, well, that's too big. And you've got to have a childlike uh, posture to receive it. And so I just want to encourage you to do that tonight, all right? Yeah, I got uh, Autumn. Was that Autumn back there waving at me? Uh, no, somebody, a child was waving at me. Anyway, so I was like, yes, it's children. <clears throat> all right, so let's go tonight. Uh, let's begin in Acts chapter 13, verse 43. I'm going to begin there, and we're going to look at a few other places, and I want to talk to you about the specific way I believe God wants to speak to you about purpose. Acts 13, is that right? I don't know if, no, that's not right. Yeah, Acts 13, 47. Acts 13, 47. I want to talk to you about one of the ways in which God wants to speak to you about your purpose. It's for every single person in the room. One of the ways in which God wants to speak to you about purpose is by causing one of the verses, or a handful of verses, but one of the verses in this book, God wants to cause one of the verses in this book to come alive in you. God wants to use one of the verses in this Bible right here, the one in your lap, or maybe you're looking at a Bible app on your phone, I don't know, or maybe you left that home tonight, I don't know where your Bible is, but... Wherever your Bible is, God wants one of the verses in that book to become a paradigm-shaping, life-transforming lens through which you see everything else in your life. God wants you to get a hold of a verse, or rather, He wants one of these verses to get a hold of you and change you forever. All right? So I'm going to show you how in the Bible... People in the Bible found their purpose in the Bible. In the Bible, people in the Bible found their purpose in the Bible. And it changed them. And I believe because we see that as a precedent in Scripture, we can apply it to our lives as well. Listen, when one of these verses get a hold of you and and you know it's yours by revelation, whoa, it's like... The decades of your life, they get framed by that verse. And you think you've got clarity on it at one level, but the more you walk with God, he just keeps like unpacking it again and again and again. And you're like, I thought I had it, but I didn't have it all. And now now he's showing me more. And so I'm going to look at a few moments in scripture where that happens. Maybe glance at the Psalms. Maybe tell us some personal story about this, and then we'll see where we go. I just want to. I, I just want to pray. I told Pastor Josh earlier. I was like, "Hey, man, at the end of service, I just want you to get up and just release the spirit of revelation. It's something he carries." Because I'm like, I just we need eyes to see, we need ears to hear. And so I'm going to talk a little bit, preach a little bit, and then we're going to pray and um, and see what happens. Okay. So Acts 13:47. Let me give you a little bit of context. The context is Paul and Barnabas or Barnabas and Saul, he's actually moving into his Paul identity at like during this chapter. They've just been set apart for the work of God. We just talked about that a lot during the ordination. And as they're going, he, they run into some conflict as he is ministering to the Jewish communities and synagogues. And so when he, when he faces that conflict, here's his response as these communities are rejecting the gospel. Acts 13, 47. For so, uh, let me go back to 46, sorry. 
Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Verse 47, for so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. This is a very simple thought, but it is so profound. Paul framed his ministry around one verse that God gave him out of the book of, out of, the book of Isaiah. In verse 47, he quotes a scripture, he quotes a verse out of the book of Isaiah, and he's saying here, God gave me a commandment. He commissioned me with a purpose. He gave me clarity about my assignment. And the place I got it was in a scroll entitled Isaiah. When I was in that scroll reading the prophets, I came across a verse. And when I came across the verse, I had read a hundred times all of a sudden, I saw myself in the verse. The verse apprehended me. The verse erupted on the inside of me. And now when I face conflict in these Jewish communities, I don't get offended at them. I say, I know why you're rejecting me. It's because God has already given me a commandment. And that commandment is to be a light to the Gentiles. Paul's life verse is right there in Acts 13, 47, and it comes out of Isaiah, and that one verse frames the entirety of his ministry. It's amazing to me that Paul lives his life in obedience to a verse. God wants to give you that verse. Are those verses. I've got a few. I, I keep them around. God wants to give you that. God wants to give you a verse or verses or a passage or a book of the Bible. Sometimes it gives you a whole book. God wants to give you that out of the Word to give you a framework for your assignment and your call. Now, sometimes you may look at that and you say, wasn't that a little arrogant to go to Scripture and say, that verse is about me? Yeah, it is, kind of, but not kind of, because all of them are about Christ, and you're in Christ. Jesus said, all scripture's pointing to me, and then Paul said in Colossians that your real life is hidden with God in Christ, so your assignment is found in his assignment, and when, so when you read about, in the scripture, his assignment, you have an expression of that assignment in the earth. How do we know that? Okay, so this verse in Isaiah that Paul quotes, God is saying it initially to Israel collectively. I have set you, I've called you to be a light to the Gentiles, right? But when we get into the Gospel of Luke, that verse is prophesied over Jesus, we get into the Gospel of Luke, and when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple, Simeon says about Jesus when he's an infant, you are set as a light of revelation to the Gentiles, quoting this verse out of Isaiah. So yes, the verse is about Israel. Yes, the verse is about Jesus. But Paul, in his own way, found his own personal purpose in the verse, and it framed his life. So yes, when you read this book, yes, there is a storyline that's bigger than you, but there's also a storyline that includes you. So let it get a hold of you. <laughs> let it get a hold of you. Live in this book until it lights you up for the purpose God's given you. Now let's go to John chapter 1. And I want to show you another moment where someone else found purpose in the book. John chapter 1, verse number 19. John 1, 19. Now, this is the testimony of John. So, John the Beloved is writing about the testimony of John the Baptist. Now, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. It's interesting to me in verse 20 that before John describes who he is, he affirms or describes who he's not. Sometimes... 
the path toward purpose, it includes you finding out who you're not before you find out who you are. And sometimes that's a painful thing. Because you can go after certain things only to discover that's not who I am. But that was good for John because it kept him focused on who he was. Because if you spend your whole life trying to be who you're not, then you'll never be who you are. And so John says, who am I? First, you need to know I'm not him. I know that you're asking me, you're saying, who are you? But you're actually asking me, are you the Messiah? And no, I'm not. I'm not him. Who are you then? Verse 21. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? I love it. What do you say about yourself? John, when you think of John, what do you think? John, when you think about yourself, how do you describe yourself? What is the framework you use? What is the, what is the language you use to describe who you are, what you do, your assignment? What is it? Here's what he says, verse 23. He said, I am, and then what does he do? He quotes a verse from Isaiah. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Like Paul, John the Baptist had a scroll open. And when he's reading the scroll, studying the word, all of a sudden, a verse gets a hold of him. <laughs> that verse comes out of Isaiah chapter 40. There's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And when John reads that, boom, it's a moment of personal revelation. And he says, it's me. I found my part in the story. I'm being apprehended by something. And that verse created the framework for him to live the rest of his life. Like Paul, he lived the rest of his life in obedience to one verse. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. I want to tell you something. When God, when, when God touches something for the, with the spirit of revelation, it doesn't matter how old you get or how long it's been since that revelation moment happened. It stays living on the inside of you because it came out of the, the, the eternal revelatory realm of God. Right. Things that get stale to you are most likely things that did not come birthed out of revelation. Because when there's the touch of revelation on it, it never dies. It lives and it lives and lives. How do you live your whole life in response to a verse? Because when the spirit of revelation, revelation touches that verse and reveals that that verse is fulfilled, at least in part, through your life, you just, you never stop. You never stop. It becomes, it just, it becomes, like I said, living to you in a way that changes everything. Uh, a few conferences ago, we're going to go to uh, Psalm chapter 40 or Psalm 40. Um, this last conference, Chase released something that I've not been able to get away from. It is like really grabbed a hold of me. Uh, he actually first released it to our team during the kids' ramp and then released it during the conference at Summer Ramp. And he said he heard this phrase from the Lord that I want to give this new, I want to give this generation a new tablet and a different scroll. Good. You know, if you're a parent, you know the tablet thing. <laughs> Go get on your tablet. And Chase said, I, I heard from the Lord, the Lord saying, I want to give this generation a new tablet. And it's not the electronic tablet that, that numbs the mind. It's a tablet like Moses got on the mountain, filled with the word of God, right? A new tablet and a new scroll that we would not waste our lives scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. But we'd receive from the Lord the scroll for our lives. And every time he says that, I love the first half, a new, new tablet, but something about that second half, a different scroll, that has just really gotten a hold of me to say, Lord, like Ezekiel, we want 
to know the scroll. We want to eat the scroll. Like John, we want to eat the book. God, we want a better story. We want a better story for our lives than what this thing says about who we are. We want to know what your scroll says about us. We want to know your story. We want to know our part in the book. Listen, I'm telling you, when you get touched by revelation about your part in God's story, all of a sudden, life has a different thing to it. It's got a different umph to it. It's got a different I, I just, intentionality to it. It's got, a, it's got a different, it doesn't mean they're not hard days. It just means you know the why behind the hard days. When Paul's rejected by the synagogues, he goes, listen, I'm not going to get paralyzed by your rejection because I know my verse. And my verse is I'm a light of revelation to the Gentiles, so I'm going to do my verse. When John is living out in the wilderness, he's not embraced by the priestly families in Jerusalem. It doesn't shut him down. Why? Because he knows his verse. He knows his part in the story. Doesn't mean it wasn't hard in the wilderness. He just knew the why behind the hardness in the wilderness. He knows I'm in the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And I'm telling you, when you get a hold of his scroll for you, when you read the tablet he's written about your life, I don't know, it just does something different. You just live from a different place, a, a, a place of being steadfast in the face of opposition, a place of joy, knowing that my life is not aimless. I'm not skidding toward just randomness, but I was created for a purpose and I have a part in God's story. So Psalm 40, I love these verses, verses six through eight. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Now let me just say that. I'm going to read these verses, then work backwards. All right? Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. And then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God, and your laws within my heart. Notice verse 8. I delight to do your will, O God. I delight to do your will, O God. How do you get into verse 8? I delight to do your will, O God. The way you get to verse 8 is by going through verse 7. What is verse 7? In the scroll of the book it is written of me. When you know what is written about you in this scroll, in this book, you step into a delight concerning the will of God. In the scroll of the book is written about me. Therefore, I delight to do your will. How do you find about, how do you find out what is written of you in the scroll of the book? Verse 6 tells you how to do it. My ears you have opened. <laughs> what is that? That's the spirit of revelation that opens your eyes and your ears. When the spirit of revelation comes upon you and you see what is written about you in the book, then you step into the delight of doing the will of God. Doesn't mean it's not sacrifice, doesn't mean it's not hard days, but you come just from a different place. All right, let me kind of figure out where to go from here. Can, can I just tell you a little bit of my own story about a verse? Is that okay? Lord, you want me to do that? I'm trying to figure that out. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell this to you. I think I'm listening. Just take a moment and don't look at me. <laughs> I'm, joking. I'm joking, you can look at me if you want. Everybody's like, where do we look? looking down. Ah, Lord. Okay. Yeah, I'll just tell this part of it. So I just want to tell you this, just to give you a little bit of a paradigm of maybe how this works. Uh, may happen differently for you, but 2008, I graduated from college, and when I graduated, my friend Bobby Shirley got me a graduation present, and that present was a journaling Bible, and it had wide margins. It's pretty popular now, but back then, it like had just come out, I guess. I'm, maybe they existed before then. I don't know. I just didn't know about them. So he gave me a journaling Bible. It had these wide margins with lines in them. Uh, so you could journal while you read, which it actually transformed the way I read the Bible because now I do that all the time. I don't have journaling Bibles, but I keep my own journal. And so I'm always writing while I read to keep my mind uh, and my attention engaged with what I'm reading. So I get this, and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to work. I'm going to work through the Bible. So I'm working through the Bible, and I'm just reading, and I end up in the book of Ezra. And I had never read Ezra before that I'm aware of, and so it's 2008. I'm reading through the book of Ezra, and it is just, like, lighting me on fire. Like, like these margins are not big enough to capture everything I'm writing. It's just like, ah! And then eventually, and it's not like... 
And here's what I want to emphasize about this the whole spirit of revelation. The, when this verse got a hold of me, it was not like this big encounter moment. It was like kind of like falling asleep before bed trying to journal. It like wasn't like in the middle of a 40-day fast. Now, I, if you do that, great. I'm not discouraging that. Go for it. But it wasn't in the middle of a really big, spectacular moment that this verse got a hold of me. It's like we're, you know, going to bed one night uh, at our little tiny house. We just, you know, been married for a little bit of time. And uh, we got, you know, Jack is a newborn sleeping in the next room. And I'm just trying to get some Bible in and, and journal a little bit. It's like in that kind of moment, very ordinary moment. I'm reading through the book of Ezra. I get to Ezra chapter 7, verse number 10, and a verse gets a hold of me. And it's like gripping me. Here's what it says. For Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. I know that verse doesn't sound exciting to you. It was life to me. It is life to me. It's my, like, you know, John with voice in the wilderness. It's like that verse, whoa, it got a hold of me. And so for years I lived with that verse because it spoke to me about being a, a, a Levite. Ezra was a Levite, a scribe. Ezra was a scribe, a, a teaching Levite. Ezra did all that. Pouring my life into the word, that's what Ezra did. So all of that stuff, okay, so it shaped my life. For the next 10 years, 2008, 2018, it has shaped my life. Now, there was a little phrase at the very end of that verse that was never like particular revelation to me. It was just like, man, this verse is really, really awesome. But the things I got out of it were not all that the verse said, but I didn't realize it at the time. I was just getting like all this kind of stuff, you know, teaching, Levite, priest, scribe, well, word, you know, all this stuff. I'm, I'm getting all of this. So in 2017, and I'm not taking a rabbit trail here. This makes sense in the story. And it's, the reason I'm telling this is, again, to create a paradigm for the ways in which God uses verses in this book to shape your life trajectory. So 2017, you know, you know the story. You've heard it many times, or maybe you've only heard it once or not at all. But Samuel invites Robert Stearns to come minister at the ramp, October 22nd, 2017. And I'm annoyed because at this point I'm in a weird place concerning Israel. And I'm like, Samuel, what are you doing? And so Robert Stearns comes, and I had this deep God encounter concerning Israel, all right? Now, fast forward a few months to January 2018, and I'm in Israel with Robert Stearns on a trip. And while I'm there, I am like super wrestling. Like, I, I, I guess I'm having a good time, but I'm like not having a good time because I'm wrestling in every way with, God, what are you doing in my heart right now? I'm in a weird place, kind of a funky place with Israel, trying to figure this out theologically. I'm not really a fan of this guy that I'm in the Middle East with right now, and I'm wrestling with all this, and um, I'm, I'm there with all of these, like, hyper Israel folks um, that are, like, telling me all of this stuff, and after conversations, I would go back to my room and journal and say, I cannot believe people actually believe that. That's what I was doing, okay? So, Lord's done at work. But anyway, so, <laughs> yes. So I am like really wrestling. So we finally get to the place where we get to Jerusalem. And I, <laughs> yes, <yeah>, Samuel, <laughs> we get to Jerusalem. And that's a whole separate moment that I'm not describing right now. My first glimpse of Jerusalem was quite overwhelming. I can't go down that road right now, but I'll tell you a secondary moment. I'm standing there in front of the Western Wall for the first time. And it is towering above me. And like the sheer weight of everything is landing on me. The sheer weight of, of history, of reality, of God, of theology, of all of my questions and all of my, and I'm just wrestling. And I'm standing there in front of this wall that's towering above me. And I'm just thinking to myself, God, what are you doing? Like, why am I here? What are you doing? I asked the Lord that question, not out loud, just in my mind. And so... First thing he says to me, he says, trust me, I know what I'm doing. And he said it with a tone that I knew he had a smirk on his face. Yeah, I didn't see him, but I knew he did. And so he kind of said it with that tone, like, trust me, I know what I'm doing. And then he quotes back to me my life verse, Ezra 7.10. He quotes it back to me pretty slowly, so I, didn't, so I didn't miss it. So I'm standing there, he says, trust me, I know what I'm doing. And he quotes back to me my life verse. For Ezra prepared his heart 
to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances, last phrase, in Israel. And when he quotes back to me that verse and emphasizes the phrase I'd always overlooked, God, you know what you're doing. It's a major moment for me of just personal life development, purpose, yada, yada, yada. I won't go into all the details of the results of that moment. But all that to say, that verse, he gave me 10 years before that moment. But I didn't see the fullness of the verse until that moment. And I still don't know the fullness. It's still yet to come. All that to say, I believe God, in whatever way, he wants to speak to you in ways that he gives you personal revelation about your part in this story. He wants to do that. And it's going to come in different ways. And I don't want to put any boundaries on it. Sometimes it's going to come, like I said, where it's like me, ordinary, you're kind of falling asleep, reading the book, Ezra 7, what is this about? And all of a sudden a verse gets a hold of you and, you, and, it, and it won't let go. Sometimes it's going to come through a dream. I actually did have that. I had different story, different verses, different things, but I had a dream on my 30th birthday where boom, 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 God gave me three different verses out of Deuteronomy. Bo, life verse is amazing. I've had other people get verses in different ways where God highlights something. All that to say, however the revelation comes, God, I believe, by the spirit of revelation, wants to quicken, make alive one of these verses down in your heart. And when that happens, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it changes the trajectory of things. So I want to invite the the, um, team to join me up here, the the worship team. And we're just going to pray. And uh, I want to have Pastor Josh come as well. And we're going to release the spirit of revelation. Um, If you don't mind, you're going to stand on your feet. As you're standing, I want to say this. The spirit of revelation is a real thing. The spirit of revelation is a real thing. How do we know that? First off, the Apostle Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 1. May the spirit of wisdom and revelation be given to you. Paul's praying for the church. So we know it's a real thing. The Bible talks about it. But not only does the Bible talk about it, I know that you've experienced it when, man, I don't know how, I don't know how else to describe it. Revelation is simply when something that was covered gets uncovered. And I don't know, revelation will make you sound so much smarter than you actually are. You know why? Because you just see something. It doesn't take a lot of intelligence to just see something. Like I can describe what Pastor Brian's wearing not because I'm like a design expert, but simply because I'm looking at him and I can see him. And that's the way revelation works. God simply uncovers something and gives you revelation as a gift. And from that place of vision, revelatory vision, you just live your life in response. Listen, this kind of, this kind of thing, this kind of moment is so powerful. This is what opened up, this is what opened up the gospel to the entire Gentile world. Because Peter, in a moment of prayer, poo, has a heavenly vision. And out of the overflow of revelation, he obeys it and fulfills the assignment. I'm amazed too, Paul, when at the end of the book of Acts, when he's describing his life, you know what he says? He says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. In other words, I saw something and I spent the rest of my life doing something about it. And that's what God wants to do as a gift to his sons and daughters. He just wants to take something that's covered. He wants to uncover it. And say, here you go. I just want to give you something. And when he gives it to you, it changes everything. So if you would just close your eyes, open your heart. I want to pray and then hand this over to Pastor Josh. And I don't know what you want to do. I, Josh, whatever you want. If you want to bring people down, if you, I, I don't care what, what we do. Maybe people stay in their seat. It doesn't matter to me. I just, I just want this released. I want us to receive it. So Lord, right where we are, we receive tonight. <laughs> 
the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Lord, as children, as children, whoa. Uh, I'll keep praying maybe in just a moment, but I, I do feel a word of wisdom right now. You can keep your eyes closed. It's important to receive as children because if we get too grown up in our thinking about our purpose, we try to imagine what we have to do to deserve the purpose God shows us. But that's not how this works. God simply wants to give you revelation about your purpose, not because you deserve it, but because it's found in Christ Jesus, and then you just simply spend the rest of your life doing something about it. It's a very different place. And children have a great time receiving things they don't deserve. Children have a fabulous time receiving things they don't deserve. Grown-ups, not so much. So just as a, as a, as a child, childlikeness, Lord, we ask that you'd give us the receptivity of children tonight. Lord, that we'd be willing to hear something we don't deserve. <laughs> because we don't deserve anything from you, but because you're God of grace and mercy of love, you give it anyway. So Lord, may we come under the spirit of revelation. Open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear. Psalm 40. Lord, we want to have that open ear in order to hear our part in your story in Jesus' name. Josh, would you come? I don't want to take up any more time. I just want to hand this over and just you release whatever the Lord's given you.